It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm going to read a poem by a 14th century Muslim mystic. Admit something. This is a very modern translation, by the way. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course you don't say this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. Still though, think about this. The great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with the full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in the world is dying to hear. Love me. invite you all to please stand if you are able and join us in this awesome song from Cameroon actually um, he came down Please remain standing for the morning prayer. <laughs> I know, it's hard to figure out what we're doing. <laughs> You'll get it by Christmas Day. <laughs> the Spirit of God is upon us all. What sorrow to those who stand for unjust laws. And friends, be loved by sharing the peace of Christ with your neighbor, remembering that you can hold your hands if you don't want to hug.
Our prayer for illumination was today was written by Reverend Andy James. I invite you to open your hands to receive God's message through our reading and praying. Let us pray. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us in the waiting, the watching, the hoping, the longing, the sorrow, the sighing, the rejoicing. Speak to us by your word in these Advent days and walk with us until the day of your coming. Amen. Amen. Reading from Luke, first chapter. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Eventually, Mary responded, Here I am, the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. I would invite the youngsters to come forward. If you're up here every Sunday or you're new here, come on up to the rainbow. I didn't know that Jesslyn and I were organized. She's got the Santa Claus. I've got the Grinch pants going on here. <laughs> Some people said it was more like an elf, but, you know. Um, a couple weeks ago, we started our Advent adventure by packing a flashlight in our backpack because sometimes, sometimes it can be scary when we're camping and a flashlight keeps us feels good. When God's around, we can feel more safe. And then the next week, we packed a tent because when you're camping and the wind is howling and the rain is coming down, it's so peaceful to be able to sit in a tent and then the next week we made we we thought about making s'mores because life is awesome s'mores. What's your favorite part of a s'more? Is it the graham cra the chocolate? What do you like the chocolate or the graham cracker or the marshmallow? Marshmallow. marshmallow? Okay. Does anyone like the graham cracker number one? Oh wow! I can't wait for the sermon where you get to learn where graham crackers come from. You're not going <laughs> to like that. Yeah, it's a Presbyterian pastor invented those things. Uh, this week on our Advent Adventure, if you were camping outside right now, would you wear a t-shirt and shorts? No, no, no. If you were uh, going to sleep, would you just like just have a sheet and kind of have one leg hanging out? No, you would want the most comfy and warm sleeping bag you could ever hope for. Sometimes when you're camping, you know, the ground can be hard and it can be chilly, but when you can crawl into a good sleeping bag, ooh, that's so nice. Now, your family might not always be super comfortable, but a comfy hug might show how much you love each other. Your family might even fight sometimes, but around Christmas time, being together might be the most comfortable, warm feeling you could have. In the story that Miss Margie read just now, Mary, it said the words it used, she was confused and disturbed, but the angel comforted her by making sure she knew that God had a plan, and that plan was for love. Sometimes in my life, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Sometimes I'm disturbed by what other people are doing. But God always has a plan for love, for us and for always. So the way we pray here is I say a few words, and then everyone gets to repeat them. Dear God, Dear God be, with us, be with us like you were with Mary, like were with Mary. And, teach us and teach us like she taught Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Some of you get to hang out with Santa Claus, uh, and uh, yeah, otherwise you can hang out with your families.
and later Mary sang, Oh, my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For God took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and God has done great things for me. God shows mercy from generation to generation to all who have fear. God's mighty arm has done tremendous things, scattering the proud and haughty. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped the servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For God made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. One of the cool things about the Christmas season is when people come back. <clears throat> so I think there's a fellow over there who's just come back from, th that's Josh from the Navy, right? Yeah, okay, we haven't met yet, but welcome back. Yeah, yeah. And, and Barb brought some grandkids, which, you know, on Christmas Eve, it's like grandkids. And some of you bring your, your parents here, and I forget their names every year, but I'll try, I'll do my best. But, and Sylvia, her... <laughs> Her moving truck isn't even here yet, but she showed up this morning. So sometimes Christmas is about people returning, but sometimes it's really great when people show up for the first time. So, so how, is, how is baby Alora doing? She's doing great, and how is mom uh, Noella doing? Everyone's doing great. Okay, so Tom, throw that picture up there. Okay, so yeah, we showed this before. This is a picture of baby Elora, who was born to Deborah's daughter, Noella. Um, you just congratulated them. That's good. Um, Noella, her name, like you've, you, you know the song, the first Noel. It's kind of like two different words jammed together. It sort of means the news of birth. And Noella would be the news of her birth. What a perfect name for Christmas time, right? Noella. That's, your, that's what you should be named if you're born around then. Another great name for now, um, Tom, hit the next picture. I, it looks so similar. This is Theodore. And Theod if you've met, CJ and Lisa were a young couple that had been visiting for a few months sitting over there. They had Theodore a couple days ago. Uh, congrats to them, right? Yeah. <laughs> The name Theodore means gift from God, all right? Yeah, so this little baby was unwrapped like a little Christmas present last uh, Sunday night. So uh, and let's, just, let's go back to Elora. Um, Elora's name means light of God or God is my light. The he Hebrew is a really slippery language, so it can be either one of them. But how cool is it that the last two babies born in our church are named after God in the languages of the Old Testament and the New Testament? Is that cool? Okay, let's see the baby before that. What's the next baby? This one was, this is the next one, uh, Tom, I think we got it. Yep. Uh, nope, let's do one more. Let's do one more. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, that was Hanu and Jade. Their little ones uh, was born three months ago. Uh, his name is uh, Hayden. Uh, Hayden's name means hayfield, um, which is also the same w root word where we get the word heathen. Yeah, yeah. Our nursery is going to be really balanced with like two gods and a heathen. Uh, Hanu and Jade are watching online right now down in Albuquerque with his parents. And um, we are praying for you that your baby runs through hay fields and like never pays attention to, 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 to what parents say and just has all the trouble in the world and has so much fun and through that knows that he is a gift of God. And if anyone ever calls that little baby a heathen, he's in good company because it happens to me pretty much whenever I preach the kinds of things I'm going to preach today. So you got ready for that one. Okay, so back to Alora again, because um, let's do a one forward here. I think we got one more of Alora because, you know, she deserves grandma's back there, so she gets this. Um, all through Advent, we talk about light. 
We lit the candles, right? We do that all through Advent. Um, we have imagery like the light of the world, uh, the Christmas star. Many of you came to watch that documentary about the Christmas star. Your holiday decorations, I, I hope that they speak not so much just my, I, my house shines more than my neighbor's house. I hope that your holiday decorations, the tinsel, it's an expression of how you want the world to shine in beautiful ways. You just, you, you cannot do Christmas without the theme of light. Jesus talked about the distinction between light and dark. He probably got that from, there's this obscure Jewish denomination called the Essenes. If you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, don't read them. It's the most boring thing you've ever picked up. It's really long. It's really boring. Um, it, but if you've heard of them uh, from Qumran, there was a group of Essenes based there, and they often, they would look back at the books that we call the, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and they often interpreted that through the lens of light and dark, which was spiritually helpful to them. The Essenes were not the first ones, though. They probably got their idea from the Zoroastrians. Really fun word. Zoroaster, uh, if you've ever been to the restaurant up here, Sumac, when you walk in the door to Sumac, there's, a, there's like a thing of Zoroaster right there. Um, Zoroaster lived in what is now Iran, about the same time as Isaiah, about 600 years before Jesus. He is the founder of this religion that really like focuses on light and dark, uh, order and chaos, good and evil. Zoroastrians tended to believe that the world was created by two gods that sort of personified those two things. And Zoroastrians are the one, they wrote the first flood story where someone was in an ark to kind of save the world. And they are the culture from where the wise men, the magi, uh, would, would have come from. And their thinking was that light was refreshing and revealing and life-giving. And the dark can be constricting and tormenting and dangerous, which can be helpful once in a while. When you're a little kid and you need a nightlight, the dark is scary. But is that true in all contexts, light and dark, good and evil? No, no, it's not. Light can be a great spiritual metaphor, and we will continue to, to, to talk about light during Christmas, but dark does not always mean the opposite. Dark does not always have a negative connotation. Cole Arthur Riley, she, uh, we, we've been using her poetic prayers all through the year. She points out that many people with darker skin do not like the connotation that something is wrong with darkness. And we certainly do not want to insinuate that the Christmas story is light, white, black, bad. Especially since baby Jesus was assuredly a person of color. In fact, a strong case can be made that, there, that every single character in the Bible was a person of color, every single one of them. If that disturbs you, you can work on that. Other theologians have been pointing out more and more lately that darkness, take the race thing out of it, but it's, it's not inherently threatening. But lots of times, darkness is enriching. Darkness is part of the rhythm of life. Darkness is where the important slow growth happens. I mean this metaphorically and literally. Metaphorically, so often it's in these times of intentional waiting where the growth happens. And biologically, it's in our sleep, in the dark, when our cells heal, when our spirits even heal. The point of sleep is mostly for you to process your emotions through the day. So when you don't get good sleep, that's why you're cranky. So get better sleep. That's not a heathen thing to say. But what does it mean for us, this, 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 this not diminishing the dark while we celebrate the light? Well, it, 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 we're not going to stop using candles, and we're not going to stop using the word light because it has a rich imagery all through Scripture, although maybe we can pivot toward words like bright or luminous. We, can, we have a family-friendly Christmas Eve service on Saturday at 5 p.m., and we have a luminous meditative service at 7 p.m., but not diminishing the dark also might mean that we try not to use the word dark in ways that can lend negativity there. We already try in our services not to use the word him to describe God. We already try that, and that's why part of the reason someone might call me a heathen, because the Bible says this or that. 
I never choose hymns, and some of you know this, hymn helpers, I never choose hymns that use the word blood as imagery, partly because it's just weird, but mostly because it's, it's like, a, like a beta VCR. It just doesn't make any sense anymore, so we don't use blood. <laughs> How many of you have a VCR in your house right now? Yeah, that's, that's a lot better than graham crackers. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Some progressive churches go farther. They don't even use hymns that have the imagery of up, as in God is up or hell is down. They think that pulls us away from a sense of God that's present with us at all times. So I'm not saying that we are going to cancel the word dark, but I am saying that we can be more careful about the words that we use in appropriate positive senses. And I am saying that there are so many words that we don't need to use in here or in the world because we have better alternatives. We can be so much more creative with our language because words carry power. So if we want to talk about spiritual doldrums, maybe we use shadowy or gloomy or dismal. Maybe, maybe those are useful. What else it means to appreciate the power that language carries is that outside of here in your daily life, it can be an act of prayer. It can be an act of prayer to pay attention to your words. You know how compassionate it is when you're careful talking to someone when they're in a sensitive place. You know that. You know it can be an act of justice, how you choose which pronouns to say to someone. You know it can be an act of justice when you take that extra step in so many ways to use language that is appropriate to the people that you are being with. For example, Terrell didn't know she's going to come up in this, but she is. Terrell gave such a great example in our Bible study earlier this year. And this, by the way, so she's inspiring this part, but Cammie's inspiring this whole thing because she sent me an article and she said, what do you think about this? Well, I had been thinking about it for about a year and a half, but I, I hadn't, my thoughts weren't clear yet. So Cammie kind of nudged me to think clear. That's, and that's what I'm inviting you to do in any situation, to nudge you to think clearer about these spiritual issues. But Terrell had a welcome mat. It said something like, only good vibes in this house. Is that the exact quote? Only good vibes in this house which was her attempt to be joyful and to create a safe home. Do you want your home to be a joyful and safe place? This is a high value uh, to, to create. It's an awesome goal. But at some point, as she tells us, she started to realize that it might be even better to welcome diverse feelings, to welcome sincerity and honesty, even when that's uncomfortable for others. So she told the Bible study that she wanted to get a new mat that said something like, your whole self is welcome here. Yeah, your whole self. And, and that's what I want this place to be too. You know, I, it, it's okay when you're upset. It's okay when you're upset at me. I would rather you tell me and we can have a welcoming family than if you just kind of disappear. It's a lot easier to hate, heal when we have that openness. That's more loving, more welcoming. So again, what am I inviting you to, to consider? It, it's not political correctness, which is a clunky word for just human decency. What I am inviting you to consider more deeply is how many chances you have every day, every intention, every reflection, how many opportunities you have to bring Christ's light into the world. By your thoughts, by your words, by your smallest gestures, you can say, God is my light, and I will not allow the shadows of insensitivity to take my life over. And by your prayerful intention, you can embody love, which is the word of the day, right? Love. It's so great that we have these new babies in a time when we're talking about love. You know, uh, so often, in culture, just general culture, a mother's love for a newborn is considered a premier example, the premier example of how any of us might be called to love. Now, a lot of moms struggle after birth, and that's okay. And a lot of us have totally different ways to think about love, and that's okay. And a lot of us, when we think of motherhood, we don't think of love. And that's okay. And a lot of us dads, a new father can do a lot and is called to do much more than you might even think you're called to. But a mothering parent has been carrying and delivers and sustains this child in incredible and unique ways that a fathering parent just can't do. And for many people, that is holy. Motherhood is holy. 
In the scripture that Margie just read, we hear Mother Mary. First of all, the first thing she does is, um, is say okay. There's this pause. I, d don't, don't react. But I think what that's the first scripture that Margie read is like the little, the little thing you hold and it's like plus minus. And, and then there's this big, how am I supposed to react? Right? There's this, this pause. And she says, eventually she says, here I am. She says, okay, I'm on board. But th there's a, there's a p pregnant pause in that pregnancy. <laughs> but she accepts. So, okay, so that, and then the second part that Margie reads is Mary singing a lullaby to her baby in utero. Right? It's, it's, in, it's still in there. But it's fair to assume, moms, when you, when you started singing in here, did you sing the same songs when they, when they came out? Yeah, probably, and then a little bit longer. Maybe there's new songs. It's fair to assume that she kept singing these songs to Jesus. It's fair to assume that five-year-old Jesus knew the words to this song. It's fair to assume that 12-year-old Jesus was embarrassed out of his mind when his mother still sang the song. It's fair to assume that Joseph probably told dumb dad jokes about these songs. It's fair to assume that 30-year-old Jesus looked back on all of that with warmth and with guidance and probably gave his mom a big hug. In these verses, in utero, Mary sings as an act of love, but she is singing about love. She sang others, I'm, she, she's, I'm sure she sang other songs with goo-goos and gagas and not real words. She probably sang silly songs. But this one is Mary teaching and imprinting her values on her child. This is Mary shaping the son that she wants to grow up to become. And parents and guardians, is there any greater gift and responsibility than to give shape to the person you raise? It's as big as it gets in this world. So how does Mary understand love? And how does Jesus shine that love forward? And you can, whatever Bible you have, any translation, you grab it, you can look through this. But it starts like this, line one, praise and rejoice. Mary says, this is how you start, praise and rejoice. Jesus does that as a grown man all the time. Thank you, God. Number two, acknowledge your blessings. He does that. Number three, give credit to God. Think something goes right in your life, it ain't just you, it's God too. So he does that. Number four, mercy and humility. It's not just you. So he does that. Sounds really religious so far. She's done her job as a parent. He's doing his job as a, as, as a Jesus. Then number five, number five, um, God will rip down the powerful and lift up the lowly. Wait, well, that really took a turn, didn't it? You caught that line? God will rip down the powerful and lift up the lowly. Number six, God fills up the hungry and starves the rich. This is not Karl Marx or anything. This is Mother Mary. Number seven, God helps the servant, and that's a promise. If, if you're paying attention to these words, this is like a war against Christmas. This is not the same story of just cutesy little babies. This is something else. The love that Mary wants Jesus to learn and to exhibit in the world is a radical expression of justice. It is a screed against privilege. It is a total rejection of any ideology, any of it, I don't care where you land. It's a total rejection of fiscal conservatism that abuses the poor and gives tax benefits to the rich. But most of all, it's an invitation to see and awaken to whoever is hurt by the world, to see and awaken to whoever props up those hurtful systems, and to see and awaken to however we are called to join God in healing for those victims and changing those systems. Now, I have a theory. That, that's just in the Bible. You can't, I don't know, I don't know how you argue against that. If you argue against that, you just aren't reading what Scripture is saying. But I have a theory that goes farther. You can throw this out if you want. Why did Mary care about this kind of love? Why, why does any grandma, like, shake the little baby on the knee and tell them a story? Why does any parent, like, have this expression of what love is? This is just a theory. But the name Mary was super popular in this time frame in the world, not just in the Bible, but the people who go around digging things up and looking at old languages, in every list of people, you know, if there's, a, if there's a, a, a census, there's a lot of Marys in there in these couple centuries. Uh, when you look at things that are etched into, the, etched into stone, whether they're, they're gravestones or whether they're Marys everywhere. It wasn't there before. If you look in the Old Testament, which is a lot bigger than the New Testament, there's one Mary, just one. 
who also sings a song, by the way. But all of a sudden, it goes from like a totally random name to the most popular women's name in ancient Near Eastern culture for 250, 300 years. Why would that be? Well, the name Mary or Miriam, does anyone know what it means in Hebrew? I'm going to remind you every year on this Sunday that the name Mary means rebel, rebellious. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're pointing to Maria, who is rebellious. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, John Lewis would, would say, good troublemaker. Uh, I have a couple friends who translate it punk, and they say Mary was a punk, just like in the, in the sense from the 70s and 80s, a punk. But I like rebel. I like, I like rebel. Mary's father and mother gave her that na- name, I, I assume for a reason, as it hundreds and thousands of other Marys at that time. I think Mary, this is just handsome, I think Mary's parents sang this kind of song to her and taught her this kind of sense of love and gave her that name as an act of rebellion against the oppressive Roman Empire. And I think the explosion of thousands and thousands of girls named Mary over this time, right at the same time, happens to be the same time that the Romans took over that culture. It maps up perfect. I think these thousands of families wanted their daughters to grow up to rebel against oppression because they wanted those daughters to shine a light and embody a deep sense of love for the world. Now, I don't, like, there's, there's no, the, the, the man's name that's most common then, it's not even that, John, uh, Hanson comes from John. I just found this out. My name means grace. Yeah, had to look that up. Yeah, so we're like, yeah, look at that. Uh, so, you know, maybe they were saying something to their sons, that sons, boys, I want you to grow up graceful. Women, I want you to grow up rebellious. I think Jesus grows up in this environment, and he soaks in the compassionate love of a mother who sang to him, and he soaks in the loving justice that a community is, 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 wants him to embrace, and he lived out these ways that so threatened the oppressors because the oppressors needed to have a hold on the minority and the deep privileged and the poor, he so threatened them with that new vision that he was put to death. And I think the church grew up as a way to carry on that dual sense of compassion and justice. And I think the spirit still works to bring that light into the sin-infested shadows of our world. And I think Christmas is absolutely about ripping down the systems of racism and sexism and environmental abuse and vampire capitalism, and it's about lifting up better ways to be us. That's my definition for public love, better ways to be us. Now, I know that this Mary, rebellious Mary, might be a little controversial for Christmas. She seems so woke. Hanson, can't we just have our twinkle lights and our jingle bells? And you can. You can have your twinkle lights, you can have your jingle bells. And you can consider more deeply how many chances you have every day, every interaction, every gesture, you have opportunities to bring Christ's light into the world by your thoughts and your words. You can say, God is my light. You can say, Elora, as a commitment to Christmas. By your gratitude and your grace, you can say, this is the gift of God. You can say Theodore to the world. And whenever someone decides to call you a heathen, you're in good company with Mary. (laughs) Amen.
It is possible that this week I sent you an email maybe inviting you to the birthday party for Jesus after church. I hope you can all come there and enjoy the beauty that many of you set up. It's possible I sent you an email asking for help with some, with maybe the Christmas service on this, uh, this Saturday or the Blue Christmas, the longest night service on Wednesday. I might have sent you an email, you know, to see which of the three or four of you are going to come to the service on Christmas morning. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I asked everyone, should we, I said, should we have a service on Christmas morning? And everyone says, yeah, yeah, we should, we should. I said, are you going to come? No, no. <laughs> so we're going to have a service, and it's going to be kind of cool, but it's really, really chill. So some churches tell you to show up in your pajamas, do what you want, just show up. I'm going to make cinnamon rolls in the morning. I'm going to still have the crusties all over here, so just show up and we'll do Christmas. I learned this week that those emails that I may have sent to you have been going in people's junk mail. Uh, at least three people have told me, like, oh, I found your email. And I don't know what happened. It happened in our system in 2019. We get, a, like, a free email system. I'm sorry about that. We don't have a clue what to do about that because computers uh, are clueless. Um, but I don't want to be anywhere near Camp Lejeune or, you know, everyone who wants you to pick up your package that, you know, you have to put in your info for. So look in there. Make sure that uh, Jesslyn and myself and Aaron are in your safe contacts and you'll get all the news that you want. If you want to go further and make sure to like our Facebook page, Instagram, you can see kind of neat stuff on there. I put an article up uh, yesterday or Friday about this, the, the first scripture that Margie read um, about, about Mary and the idea of consent. And it's uh, pretty fascinating, very well uh, written by a friend of mine. So, uh, but some of you think that's a lot too much. Some of you think I'm too much to deal with at times. Totally fair. I believe I'm too much to deal with myself sometimes. Uh, so to uh, swing the pendulum, the Reverend Catherine Putnam Neto will be our supply pastor for the 10 weeks that I will be working part-time remote in Turkey. Catherine will be preaching here, she'll be offering pastoral care, and she'll be helping keep the office going in a single direction. Uh, the words that have come about from, from, from me getting to know her and from several of you who have known Catherine over time, the words that, that I wrote down that people say is she's grounded, she's peaceful, she's a good listener, okay, and this one you're going to like. Your husband's giggling, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, She's better than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, he's, see, okay, you get him too. This is a good deal, right? Yeah. Um, so while I'm working there, um, get to know Catherine. She's going to be hanging out here uh, in the narthex, maybe birthday to Jesus, getting some of the birthday cake. Get to know her and know she, she's here in person and in spirit. Uh, I'll be doing as many Zoom meetings as I can, um, but we're so thankful to have you. The other word is heart-wise. It's hyphenated, but I think it's a cool one. That's how the world sees you, Catherine, and I hope this church gets to know that in, your, in our 10 weeks. Hmm. Friends, if this family of faith... Yeah. If this family of faith has ever been grounding for you, if you think we can do that for our neighborhood and be good news for this world, you are always invited to make a contribution in the basket or online. Thank you to everyone who has supported us financially, and thank God for leveraging that for God's will and not ours.
for our prayers this morning. A few people gave me some texts this morning. Um, Barbara has been hosting a couple of foreign exchange students, and um, one of those young ladies has lost an important member of her family this week and will be uh, going home to, to, uh, to help the family grieve for her great aunt. Kelly Harris, uh, who we prayed for Kelly's sister recently being diagnosed with cancer. Well, Carrie had a, Kelly had a close friend die on Tuesday and then found out that his cousin has run out of options uh, to fix his lungs. Uh, and so he's, I think he's, he said he's coming back from California right now. So that's, that's a triple, triple hit in a, in a time like this. Uh, I do again invite you to the blue Christmas service. Many churches do this for people when Christmas doesn't bring up all joyful memories, when we need a place to grieve in a holy way, uh, that's what this service is. If you've had a loss this year, if you're still carrying grief, as we all do in many ways, but if you are carrying an acute grief that you would like to come and be surrounded by others who hold that with, uh, with compassion and with shared, with shared wisdom, then you're invited to that service. And in this time, we're going to pray together. God of all that is and has been and will be, Grant us a sense of your timing to submit gracefully and rejoice boldly. Teach us to rejoice for all those blessings that we know. God of short days and long nights, teach us the lessons of waiting. Teach us the seeds hunkered down and waiting in their sleep, resting for their turn to climb back up again. Teach us of the lessons of endings children growing up, friends moving on. Teach us the lessons of jobs concluded, grieving done, grudges worked through, blaming canceled, excuses silenced. Be the comfort that ends pain for those that we pray for them now, for Barb and Katerina, for Kelly and all places in his family, for all those names in our hearts of losses and people that we care about who've had losses. God, teach us the lessons of beginnings, that we might see the starting place to be given new life, that we might be given a song to sing again, a relationship to rekindle, a love to fulfill. Grant us a sense of your timing. And this we pray together and with all creation through the words you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let, let's, you want to sing the song first or do this thing first? Let's do this thing. It's up here. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good.